Okay, I want to welcome all of you to our Polar Connect event. We're very excited to be talking with uh, Nell Herman and the team that she has been working with down in the Palmer Station, Antarctica. They're going to be sharing their um, their science with us about the seafloor organisms and how it's changing, or and how they're being impacted by the changing ocean conditions down there near Antarctica. Um, today, in North America at least, it's March 2nd, 2012. And before we um, get too far along and we have Nell talk, we're going to share a few things about um, the platform we are using today. So many of you just signed on a little bit ago and are, are getting squared away. Um, this um, illustration shows some of the features of Blackboard Collaborate, um, the online platform we're using. There's a uh, chat feature which many of you have discovered. You can chat to everybody in the room or you can chat to an individual. Um, there's a list of participants and some of the nice features about the list of participants is above. At the very top of the list is a little hand icon. There's also emoticons and some other things. But we, we will be using the little hand icon for when you want to ask your questions later on. So you can click on it to, to uh, raise your hand and you can click on it to um, lower your hand. The content will be shown in the center of the screen. We are not using video streaming today, so you won't see Nell's um, face or any of the other uh, scientists, but um, she does have a lot of pictures and some um, um, beautiful scenery and pictures of the science team that she's going to share in the center of the screen with us today. Um, this event is being archived. We'll post the link on our website and we'll send it out to registrants. Um, when you do come, when you do have the opportunity to talk, and if you're talking through your computer today and not the phone, it's very important um, with all of these people that we don't get feedback and we don't leave mics open. Um, so the best way to do it is you click on the talk button, um, which is under the audio video section. Click on it once to open your mic. Say what you got to say. Click on it a second time to close your mic, and then the next person can talk. Um, if you're joining us by phone, you will um, need to mute your phone, star six to mute, and star six to unmute. And I think that covers most of the features. If you have any questions along the way, Sarah and I are here to help you. Um, just type a, a message in the chat room, um, and we'll we'll respond as soon as we can. Also, while you're up there, if you want to type into the chat box where you are and how many students you have with you, we want to know who's out there. Okay, great. So, um, so a few things about um, uh, about this presentation and why Nell is down in Antarctica at all. She is participating in a program that is funded by the National Science Foundation. And it's a program where we place, uh, we are funded to place teachers with research teams in both the Arctic region as well as the Antarctic region. And we call this program Polar Trek. And we have had money for a number of years. And our goal is to place these teachers with these researchers so they can learn all about the cool things that are happening in the Arctic and the Antarctic and bring them back to classrooms such as you're, you are all in. Um, and uh, we should be funded for till 2013. And uh, we look forward to hearing more about what Nell has to say here in a second. So this is a slide we'll bring back again. You'll have time um, at the end of the presentations to ask your question live. But if you have questions while Nell or the research team are talking, you can type them in the text uh, chat box. And then um, Nell or hopefully somebody from our team will have time to respond to them or we'll cue Nell as to, you know, there was a question now, um, you know, can you answer this right now. Um, again, at the very end of the presentation, click on the little hand icon above the list of participants and we will call on you. Um, when we do and you get the microphone, remember click on talk, talk loud and clear, say who you are, what school you're with, and then make sure you click, unclick that talk button again. Okay, I think we're ready to begin. So we're going to go to your slide um, with the team now. So go ahead. 
so much for being here. I'm really excited that there are so many people here with us today. And right now I have my the whole research team that I've been working with sitting here, which is awesome. So you can see in the picture there Dr. Amsler, who some of you met when he came to visit in State College, and Dr. McClintock. Both of them are professors at the University of Alabama at Birmingham, and they're marine biologists. But there are three other people who are really important on this project. Maggie Amsler, who's Mrs. Amsler, Chuck's wife, Dr. Amsler's wife, and she's a great scientist and cool lady. And then two others, graduate students who you've seen in my journals, Kate and Julie, who are also fantastic. So we're all here um, to talk to you about uh, the Western Antarctic Peninsula and Palmer Station and a little bit about ocean acidification in general. So one thing that really has struck me since I've come um, is that a lot of the people who are here at Palmer Station have been here many, many years. And that's true for the Amslers and Dr. McClintock. They've been coming here for a long time. And they'll tell lots of sort of anecdotal information about how the peninsula and the area around Palmer Station has changed because of warming of air temperatures and water temperatures in the area. And anecdotal information is good. You know, observations and things that people see and can describe are good, but what's even more important is to quantify some of those changes scientifically. So what I think is really interesting is that there's a whole group of scientists who come here to Palmer Station to quantify what they're seeing and how things are changing over time. So for me, I've had the opportunity to participate and um, kind of tag along in the field with different types of scientists. So Dr. Amsler and McClintock are marine biologists, as I mentioned, but I've also gotten to do some field work with an entomologist, a um, person who studies insects, an ornithologist who studies birds. And I've also gotten to talk quite a bit with some geologists while I've been here. And what's really neat is that they're all studying the same area and observe, observing how things are changing and being impacted by warming and climate change and talking together and collaborating about the things that they're learning, which is a really powerful model, I think. So I'll tell you a little bit more about Palmer Station. I think some of you already know um, there are three research stations uh, uh, that the United States has in Antarctica. There's McMurdo and there's South Pole, um, and some Polar Trek teachers have gone to those places. Palmer Station is the smallest of the three, and it holds 45 people at a time. And most of the research done here is uh, marine science research, which is really interesting. Most of the projects, too, fall under an umbrella kind of um, called the LTER, which is Long-Term long Ecological Research. And so what science scientists are doing, I sort of mentioned before, they're looking at different aspects of the ecosystem here and kind of how they interact and how changes are affecting different parts of the ecosystem and how it's affecting the whole picture, which is pretty neat. Nobody's really studying anything in isolation. Everybody's kind of looking at different parts of the whole puzzle. Hi, Michelle. I see you just joined. So I would take the next slide. Um, so this is kind of showing you essentially the uh, general sort of schematic of the ecosystem here. It's fairly simple, um, but as I mentioned, the different scientists study different aspects of the ecosystem here and how they interact. If you've been reading my journals, you've seen that I got to go out in the field with some scientists from Rutgers University who study phytoplankton. And that was really interesting to see how they use the uh, slocum gliders to study phytoplankton. And like I mentioned, each project that the scientists are doing kind of fits together as part of a whole to look at the ecosystem as a whole, as a whole thing rather than just separate parts. I would take the next one. So what was kind of surprising and also really cool to me is that most of the scientists have to access their field sites by going out on zodiacs, which are inflatable boats. Um, very little research is actually done here right around the station. There are a series of islands close by that scientists travel to in zodiacs to collect samples or study the things that they're studying. And of course, the group I'm with, it's really exciting. They go scuba diving to collect their samples, uh, which they're studying back in the lab. So at this point, I think I'm going to hand the presentation over to Dr. Amsler, who some of you know, and he'll talk about his research. Okay. Well, hello, everybody. Um, so 
Ms. Herman talked about the LTER and the food web that she showed is largely one of the pelagic organisms, organisms that are living up in the water column. Our group does uh, a little bit different work in that we work on the organisms that live on the bottom of the ocean, uh, the so-called benthic organisms. You've heard a lot about the project that we're doing this year, which is uh, a project looking at ocean acidification, and you'll hear more about that later on. Uh, that's a new project for us. And what we're doing, uh, or what we've been doing here for much longer, uh, I guess for about 12 years here, and then uh, Jim and to a lesser extent me, uh, for about 10 years before that in another part of Antarctica, have been looking at chemical ecology <coughs> of the benthic organisms. And chemical ecology is the study of how organisms interact with each other using chemistry. And that can be communicating with each other using chemistry, uh, or it can be using chemistry to defend yourself. And many of the organisms that we work on, like the seaweed that you see in the lower part of the um, di of the slide, or the animal in the uh, upper center, which is a, a tunicate, uh, which is kind of a blobby organism that looks a lot like a sponge, but th they they're stuck to the bottom. They can't get up and run away when somebody's trying to eat them. And the sea stars that you see over on the left move so slowly that they can't get away quickly. And many of these sorts of organisms use chemistry, uh, use chemical compounds to, to make themselves taste bad. And for a lot of reasons that I won't bore you with, Antarctica is a really, really good place to ask questions about chemical ecology and chemical defenses. And so that's something that we, along with a collaborator named Bill Baker in Florida, have been doing for some time. So if we go to the next slide. Bill Baker is a chemist, and his role in our in our project, so Jim McClintock and I sort of lead the ecology side of chemical ecology. Bill leads the chemical side of chemical ecology. And um, many so, so as we are discovering and Bill is identifying compounds that have ecological activity, we also make these available to places like the National Cancer Institute uh, and lots of other drug screening um, projects, both in Florida, at UAB where we are, and all over the country. Now, about half of all pharmaceutical drugs that are used uh, are based upon compounds that organisms like the ones we study and others make for their own ecological reasons. And so as we discover these new compounds as part of our ecological research, um, they get used in, in drug screens. And as you can see uh, on the screen there, uh, we found a number of compounds that have had interesting and potentially useful um, medical purposes. Over on the right is that blobby organism, that tunicate that I talked about before. And it makes a compound called palmarolide, named after Palmer Station. And palmarolide is uh, showing good activity as a potential anti-melanoma or skin cancer drug. In the lower center, you see a, a red alga or red seaweed uh, called gigartna. And gigartna uh, makes a compound. We haven't named it yet, um, but that appears to have very strong anti uh, viral properties and might very well help protect people against uh, the flu or perhaps even something like HIV. And although it's not as far along in the upper left, you see uh, a, a sponge that grows encrusting on a rock. Um, and it makes a compound called norcilic acid, which is named after Norsel Point, which is actually where Palmer Station is, that uh, is showing some activity as an anti-malarial. Next slide, please. So the work that we're doing here now uh, concerns global climate change. And as you can see in the, the, the slide, the, 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 the red uh, is indicating areas of Antarctica that are warming rapidly. And we're located in the Antarctic Peninsula, which is uh, towards the upper left 
uh, of, of that area. And this is actually a part of the world that's warming the most rapidly. And so it's a very important place to look at uh, changes in, in the environment. So next slide. What you see in the, in the next slide, um, it, well, you, you see a, on, the, on the right an, a, a satellite photo of the Antarctic Peninsula, and the arrows pointing towards Palmer Station. And just a little bit south of where the arrows pointing is a very long-term data set. You know, it goes back to, to 1945. At a, originally at a British station uh, called Faraday that is now used by uh, Ukrainian scientists and is called Vernansky Station. But this is one of the longest uh, and most dramatic uh, records of temperature increases in, in the world, and particularly in Antarctica. And it shows that over these last uh, 60 plus years, uh, the, the, the wintertime temperatures have, have warmed uh, you know, over 6 degrees Celsius, which is a lot. Uh, and it's had dramatic impacts on lots of things, particularly the sea ice. And this, the sea ice uh, grows out from land much later in the, in, the, in the fall and winter, and it recedes much, much earlier in the spring. And those changes in sea ice cover have had dramatic uh, effects. The sea ice also, uh, the temperature has also affected the uh, glaciers around here. If we can have the next slide, you see uh, a map of uh, the little spit of unglaciated land that, that Palmer Station is on. Uh, and it, it's, oh, it, it's actually Gamage Point. I was wrong. Norsel Point is a different point of land. Uh, but anyway, we're on Gamage Point. And you can see in the blue over there uh, towards the right, each of those uh, contours is where the glacier behind the station was in those years, starting in 1963. Now, I first came here in December of 1985. And, uh, excuse me, uh, <laughs> and so in, in 1985, uh, the the glacier was still fairly close to the station. If you look at the line on the far right, that's 2007, and it's receded even further than that now. Glaciers all up and down the peninsula of Antarctica and other places in western Antarctica as well are receding very rapidly, and um, many more of them are receding than, than really should be based upon just the normal uh, ebb and flow of, of glaciers. It's been very, very dramatic seeing uh, how much uh, land has been opened up as the climate here is warmed. Now, we have these really nice maps of uh, the glaciers uh, because of in the next slide. Although those earlier contour lines on um, the last photograph or the last drawing were based upon aerial photographs, now every year uh, a technician from the station walks along the edge of a glacier. And that funny thing sticking out of his backpack is a very accurate differential uh, GPS um, receiver. And so we now have very, very accurate maps every year of how the glacier is receding. And it's, it's documenting what Ms. Herman was, was talking about earlier, what we all know from, from our own personal observations is a very dramatic change in, in the environment around here. If you go to the next slide, we, we hear how the glacier uh, is changing as well. This is a photograph of a glacier calving or a piece of the glacier breaking off and, and falling into the water. Now, the glaciers have always calved here quite a lot, uh, as long as any of us have been coming. But over the, over the years, uh, the calving rate has, has increased. Uh, and we've, we've really seen huge, huge changes in the glaciers uh, all around the station that match what you just saw in the uh, diagram that I showed you last. So I'm, think I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Jim McClintock for the next slide. Um, uh, just uh, real quickly, uh, real quickly. Go ahead. 
um, click on your mic. So you don't get click, on your mic click on the top button. Click on the top button. Yeah. Okay. We had um, two questions that came up. Um, that uh, we wanted to see if you could answer well before we get to the next session. Um, one was, uh, are we over the tipping point on warming? And then the second one is, have any uh, geological surprises been revealed as the glaciers retreat? And just press your talk button again so that we can hear you. So um, as for the, the question of are we at a tipping point, I don't think there's, there's really a way to, to, to know that. Um, unfortunately, we, we, we could be at the tipping point and not know it. Uh, until it's in, until we're on the other side and can see how fast we're moving away from that tipping point. I hope we aren't, um, but there's really no way to be sure. As far as the the geological um, uh, changes, I, I don't know that there has been a dramatic geological discovery, but the the geology project that's working here right now, our soil scientists. Uh, really are taking advantage of uh, working right next to re uh, recently retreated glacier in their study of permafrost. So, so they are uh, taking advantage of the fact that there's a lot of new real estate opening up. Um, in terms of the geography, the geography of the area is changing uh, dramatically as the, as the glacier recedes, we're, we're finding all kinds of new little islands that were completely covered by the glacier, uh, and and now uh, they're 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 out there. And uh, there's a, another big island right across from us that I expect in another cut. Well, what looks like it's going to be another big island uh, in a couple of years' uh, time. So I'll I'll pass it on to to Dr. McClintock. Well, greetings. This is Dr. McClintock, and uh, if I could have the next slide. So I want to talk a little bit more about what's going on uh, in terms of the impacts of warming on these uh, the ice along the coast. And as Dr. Amsler mentioned, um, there is an annual sea ice that forms. And this has been retreating to a great extent uh, along the western Antarctic Peninsula, about a 40% reduction in its extent. And this has important consequences for a number of the organisms that live in tight association with that sea ice. So why don't we go to the next slide. One of the organisms that's most tightly coupled with the annual sea ice, and that's probably I would think one of the most important organisms in all of the Antarctic oceans are krill. Um, their scientific name you can see on the bottom is Euphausia superba. And it was discovered that when krill are juveniles, uh, when they're teenagers, they live on the undersurface of the annual sea ice. And the reason that they're doing that is they're grazing on algal cells uh, that live on the bottom of the ice. And you can actually see in this picture a swarm of juvenile krill grazing on this greenish colored material on the underside of the sea ice. So the problem is, is that as the annual sea ice is diminishing and going away, we're losing uh, a lot of the krill that used to be found up along the northern end of the peninsula. And this has important ramifications because think of who feeds on krill. Baleen whales fill, feed on krill. Seals feed on krill. Fish feed on krill. Even things like starfish feed on krill in some cases. And don't forget those penguins. Penguins are very dependent on krill. In fact, downstairs right now at the marine lab here, people are investigating the stomach contents of penguins and finding them filled with krill. And they can get those stomach contents by getting the, the penguins to throw up their krill. They don't have to hurt the penguins beyond that. Next slide. Okay, so let me, since I'm on the topic of penguins, this is a very interesting story with climate warming that's going on right here in our backyard. I want you to look at that top left panel of the Adelie penguin. 
and then look down at the chart below. And that purple line uh, is the number of Adelie penguins that were on the neighboring islands here near Palmer starting in 1975. And a very well-known penguin biologist by the name of Bill Fraser has documented that there were 15,000 pairs, breeding pairs of Adelie penguins in 1974. But now, in uh, 2012, um, there are only about 2,000 breeding pairs left, so about 80% of the Adelie penguins have disappeared over that period of time. On the other hand, the other two penguins at the top of the, of the graph, the Gen 2 and the Chin Strap, uh, have actually been increasing in smaller numbers. Note the scale on the right is a little different than the left. But there are now about oh, a little over 200 breeding pairs of chin strap penguins and over 1,000 pairs of gentoos. Now what's interesting in the scenario is those two species of penguins aren't really supposed to be here. They're more sub-Antarctic species that are moving down the peninsula as it's warming and starting to establish breeding colonies. So why is the Adelie having such a problem? If I could have the next slide. Okay, so I'm going to tell you the end of the Adelie story and then we'll talk about this fellow right here. The Adelies are having trouble because they're getting heavily snowed upon later in the season and that's covering their eggs and causing some mortality in the Adelie penguins. And they also are having trouble because they have to get out to sea to catch krill and they use the annual sea ice as a platform to do that. And as the annual sea ice is disappearing, they're having trouble getting out to sea. So they're paying costs in terms of their energy retrieval. Okay, so this fellow here is the Waddell seal. And he's tightly, he or she is tightly associated with the uh, sea ice as well. And the problem here is that they depend on the sea ice for a place to have their young. They can get through the sea ice with these amazing chipping ice teeth and then create a hole that's large enough that they can climb out and the female can give birth on top of the sea ice well away from predators like the killer whales and the leopard seals that are searching up and down along the ice edge trying to catch seals and penguins for a meal. Next slide. Now there are some other seals in the area that are showing up as it's warming. The elephant seal and the Antarctic fur seal. The elephant seal is a large seal that can get up to several tons in size on the upper photograph. And the Antarctic fur seal is a very uh, ferocious little seal that you don't want to get too close to. It'll growl at you. Um, but both of these seals are typically found in slightly warmer places, but they're beginning to move down the peninsula as warming is occurring. And the elephant seals now are, are actually having uh, babies and colonizing the area and probably the Antarctic fur seals aren't far behind. Next. Now one of the most amazing discoveries, I think, that's happened in the last uh, decade has been the discovery of king crabs marching up the Antarctic slope into shallower waters surrounding Antarctica. Now that may not seem like such a surprise until you know that king crabs have never ever been found near Antarctica. They probably haven't lived in Antarctic waters for millions and millions of years. Why is it that king crabs might now be invading Antarctica for the first time after all that uh, many, many millennia? It's probably because as climate change is warming the ocean, uh, king crabs are being allowed, because they have a really hard time at low temperature, uh, surviving and regulating certain uh, things in their blood, they're being allowed for the first time to move up into this system because of the warming. And this could be a problem because king crabs, as you know, have big crushing claws. And the animals that live on the seafloor in Antarctica are very, very poorly defended. They have weak shells, they're sluggish, and these king crabs could move into this system and really cause a lot of problems for the marine life that surrounds Antarctica. This might be important because Dr. Amser was talking about how there could be cures to cancer and different kinds of diseases here in the organisms that surround Antarctica. And so if the crabs move in and decimate populations of different marine invertebrates, we might lose something as important as a cure to cancer. Next. 
All right, so now I want to talk just very briefly about the reason that we're here on this particular research expedition. Um, we're here to study ocean acidification. And sometimes this is referred to as the other CO2 problem. And it has to do with the fact that as we put more and more carbon dioxide into the world's atmosphere, the oceans absorb about 30% of that carbon dioxide. I'm not going to go into the chemistry, but when, you, when the ocean absorbs carbon dioxide, it creates more acidic conditions. The seawater becomes more acidic. So animals like snails, such as the one shown to you in this picture, animals that make a shell are having trouble because not only is the shell potentially going to dissolve when the ocean becomes more acidic, but the, the very components of what they build their shell with become limiting as the ocean becomes more acidic. So it's harder to make a shell. It's harder to pr protect your shell from it dissolving. And Antarctica, because the Southern Ocean is the greatest sink for atmospheric carbon dioxide due to its huge size, and also because of the low temperatures and how that plays into the chemistry, is really the canary in the coal mine for ocean acidification. We can study that here and learn about the impacts of ocean acidification that are yet to come uh, closer to home for all of you. So it's a wonderful laboratory for us all, and that's why Julie and Kate are here uh, doing their graduate work on this very fascinating question of ocean acidification in Antarctica. Next slide. All right, so I want you to take a look at this beautiful cartoon that uh, shows the Antarctic Peninsula in its traditional state as it had as it been for many millions of years before climate warming. And what you can see is that the annual sea ice is present. The Adelie penguins are very numerous. There's lots of krill in the water uh, because there's great places for them to feed on the underside of the sea ice. You have a very rich community of animals on the seafloor, and there's forests of macroalgae on the seafloor. And that big arrow on the left is the Antarctic circumpolar current that brings nice, rich nutrients up into this system and makes it one of the richest systems in the world. Now, the next slide will show you what's happening. Here's a slide showing what it looks like after climate warming has occurred. This is probably what it's going to look like around the middle part of the century. Um, it's predicted that the annual sea ice will no longer exist along the peninsula. The Adelie penguin will be gone, and the Gentoo and the Chinstrap penguin will have moved in to the system, and they would be then the dominant species here. King crabs, you can see the big king crab down there on the seafloor, uh, probably will have moved in. And some of the species of marine life would probably be extinct or have been pushed out of the system by the king crabs. The krill are gone uh, as the sea ice has been diminished. And of course, all the animals that depend on the krill uh, are going to have a tougher time. And again, this is all being fueled by the Antarctic circumpolar current providing nutrients. Next. Sorry. All right, so let me summarize for you. Um, what we've talked about, what Dr. Amsler and I have talked about, uh, are all related to this climate change phenomenon that is occurring here on the Antarctic Peninsula at a rate unprecedented with other regions of the world. We're seeing glaciers receding, almost 90% of them on the peninsula. The ice sheets are beginning to break up. There are nine major ice sheets that have broke up in the last 30 years. Some of them are the size of states, Connecticut, um, et cetera, huge, huge pieces of sea ice that are floating on top of the ocean that are breaking up. Um, what they do often is release the glaciers that are backed up behind them so that they move more quickly uh, into the ocean after that happens. The pack ice, the annual sea, uh, sea ice, is disappearing. You're seeing declines in populations of penguins like Adelis and other sea ice-related organisms, Waddell seals and krill. Um, phytoplankton that, uh, that uh, Nell mentioned earlier on um, are also having some trouble. 
Um, there's possible effects on the algal communities and temperature uh, as it rises may uh, have some influence on marine invertebrate larvae that are very sensitive to temperature changes. I talked about how elephant and fur seals are appearing. Uh, you have to be careful sometimes. You can walk out the door of the station and trip over a very large elephant seal, and that could be a problem. Um, there are invasive predatory species that I spoke of, king crabs. And of course, the reason that we're all here today are studies of ocean acidification uh, in this region of the Earth. So there's so much more, guys, that I want to share with you when I get home. But I think Dr. Ansler and Dr. McClintock did a great job of explaining the threats to this region, which is really probably the most beautiful place I've ever been. Um, a lot of people have complimented me on my photographs. And I'm not a particularly good photographer. It's easy to take a good photo here because it's an amazing, amazing place. And uh, so I feel really lucky to have had the opportunity to come. And uh, I'm really excited to share more with you when I get home. But I wonder at this point if anyone has any questions. Um, no? No? Yeah. OK, click the talk click button now for a second. For a second. Okay, um, so yeah, we will um, go to questions here from everybody. But I had a few questions that came up while you guys were presenting that I'm going to relay. And then um, that will give the classrooms uh, and uh, people that have big auditoriums a chance to organize themselves. Um, remember, if you want to ask a question live, just click on the hand button um, underneath the list of participants, and then we'll call on you in a moment. But I want to ask these questions first. So from uh, Jill Campbell, we, um, this kind of goes back a little ways. She wanted to know, what is special or pertinent to the science in the sea ice there? And maybe Jill might need to clarify that, but we'll start with that one. And you'll have to click on your talk button when you're ready now. Yeah, um, this is Jim, uh, Jim McClintock. And the question about the importance of the sea ice to life. Um, well, besides what I talked about, how the bottom surface of sea ice provides algae, uh, little plant cells for krill, uh, and probably other organisms as well, the sea ice itself think of as a roof uh, over the floor. And it blocks the sunlight that reaches the seafloor. So organisms like the rich algal communities that live below the sea ice are very much influenced by that lid of sea ice over them. Um, they need sunlight to photosynthesize and grow. And when the sea ice is there, that slows down. And, and this is Dr. Amsler. I, I would uh, mention, too, that when the sea ice is there at the, at the edge of the ice where it's melting, um, it makes the water less dense because there's fresh water. Uh, so it essentially dilutes the seawater. And it makes for a very shallow, stable layer at the top of the ocean. And it's in shallow, stable layers like that that phytoplankton are able to bloom and do very well. And they provide then lots of food for the zooplankton, which provide lots of food for the uh, uh, seals and penguins and so on. So the edge of the ice edge, is, or the, the edge of the sea ice, is uh, always, especially in the spring and summer as it's retreating, a very, very productive part of the uh, ecosystem. And losing that will certainly have important impacts. Okay. okay. The next, the next question, question is: is uh, uh, Would the king crab be considered an invasive species? Could you repeat? So, I want to know now: Is the king crab? Yeah. One more time. 
Okay. Uh, we want to know now if the king crab would be considered an invasive species, and just so that you and I don't walk on top of each other, when um, when you're done responding to the question, you guys just click off the talk button again, and then I can relay the next one. McClintock and uh, Maggie, who's sitting over here, is working with me on the king crab project, and, and she and I are thinking about this question. I think very much you would call it an invasive species. It's invading Antarctica from the deep, deep sea that surrounds Antarctica. So it is moving into an area that it's never been found before. So I think it would meet the definition of an invasive species. It's also a species that I mentioned is now beginning to move up the slope and onto the shelf of Antarctica. And I guess once it gets onto the shelf, we could really truly call it a successfully invaded species. Next question. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So our next question comes from Thomas in Austin, Texas. He wants to know if the ice that melted is ever going to return. So this, this is Dr. Amsler. Um, it's, it, it certainly could, but only if um, we not only slow the pace of climate warming, but we're actually able to find a, a, a way to, uh, to, to reverse it. And I think that's a, a pretty tall order in uh, any of our lifetimes for sure, and probably not in the lifetimes of your children or your children's children. Uh, the, 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 the impacts that we have now uh, are, are, are likely to stay. I, I think the best we can hope for is, is slowing the, the change. Um, we're, we're pretty much stuck with what we've done to the planet right now. Okay, and uh, one last question before I go to uh, classrooms. Uh, this came from Gary, and he wants to know, are the Antarctic waters protected under the same treaty that protects the continent? Good question. We can't hear you if you guys are talking. Sorry. Um, this is Dr. Amsler technologically challenged here. Um, so, so that's a great question. And, and yes, the Antarctic Treaty protects uh, everything as far north as 60 degrees south. Uh, really, the, the, the Southern Ocean's real boundary is uh, an oceanographic boundary, but roughly speaking, it's 60 degrees south latitude. And so for all legal and treaty purposes, uh, everything that far north is, is uh, protected. So we'll take, I'll, I'm going to turn off the talk. <laughs> I can. <laughs> you did. We got you. Okay. Now we're going to go to um, questions from classrooms. We have Howard's group standing by. So go ahead, Howard. Uh, ask your question. We do not hear you, Howard. We see the mic is open. Okay, uh, we can't hear you asking anything, so maybe click the talk button again and type in your questions, and we'll go on to Lisa. Maybe we can figure out what's going on. Okay, Lisa, go ahead. Um, hi, can you hear me all right? Uh, there's a lot of feedback. Um, okay, is this all right? Yes. yes. Do you have a question ready, Lisa? We heard you. 
You were doing okay there. Okay, well, we have lots of other classes that want to talk, so we're going to move on to Tammy. Okay, go ahead, Lisa. Hello. She's okay, Lisa, you you're kind of backwards, I think. Yep, now you can. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, um, so this is a question about the, um, I have both a comment and a question. And one is that I really like Nell's blog, um, putting in the protocols that she's using in the lab and in the field. I think that's really interesting to use with students, so I wanted to keep that up. And the second uh, question is, is anyone doing anything with DNA studies on um, either the, um, the wingless flies or the invasive crabs? All right, hit the talk button, Lisa. So it's Nell, how are you? Okay, okay. Good. It's nice that you're here. Um, I actually had the opportunity to go out in the field with a graduate student the other day, uh, Yuta Kawarasaka from uh, Miami University in Ohio, and he is studying the midge. And he's looking at some different things. He's interested in the mechanisms that allow it to survive um, over winter. But he's also looking at something which I think is kind of interesting in terms of the genetic diversity and how it varies in the midge populations from one island to another in this area. Um, you know, assuming that they are isolated from one another, he wants to look at uh, DNA differences. So I know he is doing some work with the DNA. As far as the king crab goes, I'm going to turn this over to uh, Maggie Emsler, who knows a lot about that question. Uh, hello. Yes, there is a, um, a researcher who collected many crabs last year just out in our front yard in the Palmer Palmer Deep or the Palmer Basin, as we call it, and they have done um, tissue collections to analyze DNA and with the hope of being able to determine from their analyses just how long the, this particular species has been isolated and that might give them some idea of when the crabs started appearing in the Antarctic. <coughs> Hi, it's Tammy. Okay, great. Thank you. So we're going to go to. It's Tammy. I have a student here with a question. Go. Go. Hi, I'm over in Palm Station, and what types of work they do there. All right, that was a little tough to hear, but I think it was how many scientists at Palmer Station. And what are they doing there? Is that close? Uh, it was how many how many scientists winter winter over, and what do they do when they winter over? Answer. Um, scientists do sometimes winter over. As a matter of fact, there are going to be three scientists wintering over this year. Um, their project is looking at. Uh, development in uh, embryos of the ice fish. And they need to be here during the winter because that's when the embryos develop. And the embryos are far too delicate to try and transport home. They have a really exciting project. Um, the, the, the ice fish in particular and some of the other fish that live here have very, very weakly calcified bones. Uh, and, and they're actually doing medically related research looking at, the, uh, looking at these fish as a model of osteopenia, which is uh, something that many people develop as they get older uh, and they have less calcification in their bones uh, and, and leads to the next stage. You may have heard of the term osteoporosis. That, that's the, the next stage in the, 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 the d disease that people get. 
Um, and these fish are naturally that way, and they hope that understanding how the fish cope with having such uh, brittle bones will will uh, help people uh, understand how to how to deal with and, and maybe even reverse osteopenia. So so that that's what's going on here this winter. Go ahead, Nick. Nick, it looks like okay. you're. Uh, oh, can you tell us more about melanoma? Uh, I'm sorry, can you hear that? us? Yes, no. but we didn't hear the question, Nick, so can you repeat it? Okay, this is one of my students who has a question to ask. You get kind of close to that. Okay. Uh, can you talk more about melanoma-related compounds? Is it being used today to treat people? Okay, good question. Um, well, the compound that we found in that, what did you call it, Dr. Amsler? Uh, I believe I called it a blob. Uh, yes, the, the blob, <laughs> as Dr. Amsler called it. That, that, that's the scientific term. Yes. Um, it actually does have very potent activity against melanoma um, cells in a cell line. That means you're culturing the cancer cells and you're exposing them to melanoma. And what the National Cancer Institute did then was a test. The first test they did was to see whether they could take uh, melanoma cells and put them in a little tube under the skin of a mouse and then label the compound, the, the anti-cancer compound, so that they could follow it and inject it into the mouse. It's called a drug delivery test. And that drug or that potential drug, that compound, was able to get across the cells and membranes and find its way into that little tube where those melanoma cells were. So it was successful in its ability to be delivered to melanoma, the, the actual cells. So the next hope would be that the uh, National Cancer Institute might actually take mice and graft melanoma onto their skin and then give the drug or the potential drug to the mice to see if it has uh, activity against skin cancer in that sense. So it hasn't gone to human testing. Um, and it has a long way to go before it would be something that you would buy as a drug. But it does go to show that there are potential drugs here in Antarctica, and you never know. It, it really could get there someday. Thank you. So while you're on that topic, before we go back to Nick's classroom, there was uh, Brian's group asked us, um, through the chat, their interest in how those compounds are found to send against these various diseases. Are the chemicals basically just run against everything, or are there signals that you look for? And then we'll go back to Nick's classroom. Okay, this is this is Dr. Amsler, uh, and yes, essentially that that the, they're run against everything, uh, or against lots of things. You you you, you can never know. Uh, there are thousands and thousands of compounds or, or uh, semi-purified compounds that are run through those kinds of assays. And maybe one out of a thousand will have some activity. Uh, and then they'll go to the next stage. Uh, and maybe one out of a hundred that had activity in the first stage will have activity. And then they go to the next stage. And that's kind of like what Dr. McClintock was talking about, going from uh, the, the test tube to uh, a study of um, what's going on in mice. And, and, and so every step along the way, um, you lose 90% uh, or, or, or more of the compounds. It takes a long time to, to, to get all the way through. And you never know what, what's going to have an effect. You know, um, there, there's a drug called Taxol that uh, is used to treat cancer right now that came from fungi that live in a particular kind of tree that grows in the Pacific Northwest. And it was only through uh, trying everything uh, on everything, any particular compound on any particular uh, uh, medical need that, that we find these things. It's, it's really looking for needles in haystacks, but you know, you can find a needle in a haystack if you look long and hard enough.
Okay, great. Thank you. So um, actually, I guess we answered the next question. Um, a few before we go to Tammy, there's a few questions that have been coming up. Uh, one was how deep is the water around the Palmer station? Um, and then how long will it take for the Antarctic ice cap to disappear? We'll start with that. Kate uh, Schoenrock is going to answer the water question because she has been doing a lot of diving around here. So here she is. Hi guys, and um, this is Kate. So the water around this area is very variable. You have the Palmer Deep, and then you have the areas where we go diving. And we generally stay above 130 feet of depth in depth of water. Um, we're allowed to go down 150, but any deeper is just a little bit too dangerous for the area that we're diving right now. Um, but it goes much deeper. It does go much deeper, um, for instance, where they've been finding crabs. Yeah, this is Dr. McClintock. I would just add to that that, um, that the depth of the ocean on the Antarctic shelf, the area surrounding the continent, tends to be very deep compared to other shelves in the world. And that's because of the massive weight of all the ice sitting on top of the continent. It actually depresses the continent. Um, and that gets to the question about the ice sheet that's sitting on top of Antarctica. Uh, you realize this ice sheet is over two miles deep. Just imagine. This is where uh, most of the fresh water on our planet is locked up. Um, how long might it take for the ice sheet to melt? Um, I would guess that this is a huge number. The ice sheet over Antarctica is so large and so deep uh, that it would take many, 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 many thousands of years for it to even begin to significantly melt. Now that doesn't mean that around the edges of Antarctica, as the glaciers uh, recede and the, uh, into the ocean and add water from that recession, when that water melts and moves into the ocean or breaks off as icebergs, and it was originally on the land, it's contributing to global sea level rise. And so although all that ice on Antarctica is going to take a very long time to melt, um, the amount of ice that's beginning to come into the ocean from Antarctica is alarming uh, glaciologists and people that study sea level rise. Uh, because it, there's certainly going to be an impact of that over the short term, even by the end of this century. Uh, so that's my answer there. Okay, great. Um, we're going to go to uh, Tammy's classroom. So go ahead, Tammy. I have another student. How is the Palmer Station heated, and um, is it heated by solar power? Was that how is it heated? Can you get a little closer to the microphone? Ask again. Yes. How is it heated, and is it heated by solar power? Is it heated by solar power? So how is it heated, and is it heated by solar power? Okay. Hi. This is Julie. Um, so the the station currently is not heated by solar panels, which but it's something that I think people are talking about. But it's it's mostly too cloudy here for that to be a, a really viable option. The way they do heat it is with um, big diesel generators. They have two generators in that, if you look at that picture of Palmer Station, that tall building in the back with a little porch on it. In the downstairs there, they have two generators. And those are fueled by diesel fuel that is stored over in those big white tanks. You can see them on the right there. One of them has an orca jumping. Um, so that is currently what uh, provides all of our power and our heat here on station. Um, there are some potential possibilities for using wind power to uh, fuel the station, which is exciting because that would help us not rely on the diesel as much. Okay. Um, there were a couple of more questions that came up in the chat room while we were all doing those other things. So let's see. 
Um, if Adelie penguins are lost, what impact will they have on the food chain? And what are the indicator and keystone species you look at? And this comes from Howard. So this is Dr. Amster. The Adelies really are one of the uh, keystone species uh, and, and indicator species. You know, they're they're uh, they're very near the top of the food chain, and um, losing them is is a, a, a big deal. Yes, they are being replaced by the by the gentoos and shin straps here, uh, and you might think that they could be moving further to the south as uh, Areas to the south get a little bit warmer and maybe can uh, help them better. But uh, the Adelies are very much hardwired, so to speak. Um, they essentially imprint on a rookery, and those birds come back to the same rookery year after year after year. And even though now uh, many of the rookeries around Palmer are, are no longer suitable for them, um, they still come back and they keep trying, and uh, they they have a lot of their uh, eggs and and chicks die. As a matter of fact, there's one of the largest islands here uh, is an island called Litchfield Island that used to have quite a few uh, moderate sized rookeries on them, and all of those rookeries uh, of Adelie penguins are now extinct. So um, the, the Adelies in and of themselves are are an important species. Okay, great. Um, let's see. There was another question earlier. Oh, next class, uh, they want to know why is diving below 100 feet, 150 feet, so dangerous? Okay. Hi, this is Kate again. Um, so the reason we don't go below 150 feet is generally because of the amount of time we can spend in the water. And the water around here is around 32 degrees Fahrenheit. It's pretty cold. We get really cold if we stay in there for about 35 minutes. After about 35 minutes, we start getting really cold. So that's generally the reason that um, it's uh, pretty dangerous. And deco for not going deep. Right. And um, also, as you dive, I don't know if any of you guys are familiar with diving physics, um, but you, as you go down in depth, you're increasing the amount of pressure around your body, which makes um, certain gases in air be absorbed more, um, more in, into your blood. So you have to um, basically ascend slower the deeper you go. And that, again, comes into the time issue in the water. Okay, great. And we have uh, one last question that we what came through, um, and then uh, we'll we'll end this session. So the question was uh, from Brian. A few large water predators were mentioned earlier. Has there been any noticeable impact on their population yet? And that will be our last question. Yeah, uh, this is Dr. McClintock, and the question is, have some of the large predators that uh, I mentioned earlier, the leopard seal and the killer whale, would be the top predators in this system. Are we seeing any declines in their populations? Um, it's actually something that, that people are wondering about, but there isn't a lot of good data. There aren't a lot of good observations on the population dynamics of either the, the leopard seal or the killer whale. Part of it is um, they're just hard to count. Um, leopard seals are very cryptic. They're swimming around underwater. They're on ice flows. That you can't really get a good estimate of their populations. And the killer whales also are, are really something that, that people are just starting to get a handle on here down in Antarctica as far as their population dynamics. Um, as far as what I might suspect, because of the loss of the annual sea ice, I would think that there's the potential that these animals might be impacted because they do tend to hunt along the edge of the sea ice for their prey. So as the sea ice is diminished, um, you may see fewer and fewer of them. They may move south where there's more sea ice to do their foraging.
All right. Well, we want to uh, thank all of you for uh, joining us today. There's always been a couple of people that had to sign off with their classes and everything. And uh, great job by the team down there in Antarctica. Very interesting science you all are doing, and I think everybody got a lot out of it. Um, again, this event um, will be archived, and we'll send out the uh, link and post it on the website. So if you joined us late, you can. Um, Check it out later. Um, and if you didn't get your questions uh, answered, um, be sure to go to um, the expedition website on polartrek.com and you can post it in the Ask the Team forum. And um, I think that's all from our end. And we'll stop the archive, and those that are on can say goodbye and all that kind of good stuff. And uh, thanks again, Mel. I learned some new things myself. So thank you guys so much. Yeah, and if you're if you're online and you want to say I uh, have to give a person <laughs> <laughs>